Okay, uh, welcome everyone to our Zach seminar. It's uh, my big pleasure now to introduce my old friend uh, Lev Borisov from University of Rutgers. And uh, Lev will speak about uh, explicit equation of uh, surfaces of general type and uh, I assume uh, fake projective planes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Vanya, for the invitation. And um, let's uh, get to it. So uh, let's see. Then, right. So uh, here is what I'm going to uh, talk about today. Uh, we'll talk about fake projective planes, definition and history, uh, Cartwright Sega classification. And then I'll uh, talk about uh, four different projects that resulted in explicit equations of fake projective planes and related surfaces. Uh, I guess this has been my obsession for the last five years or so. And uh, there are some results. Okay. So let's uh, get started. Uh, um, so um, uh, smooth complex algebraic surface, uh, smooth complex projective surface. S uh, is called uh, a fake projective plane. Um, if um, it has uh, Hodge numbers of a, of a projective plane, but it's not a projective plane. All right, so um, one can uh, re deduce various uh, consequences of it. In particular, um, S must be of general type. Uh, the way to think about it is uh, you still have a, a generator of the Picard. Uh, uh, numerically. Um, then um, uh, canonical class of S uh, uh, squared uh, is nine from Noether's formula. Uh, so canonical class of S is um, either plus or minus three H. Uh, and the minus three H uh, you get S, which is CP2. And the plus three H is a uh, uh, fake projective plane. So let's call it this, right? Fake projective plane. Um, what can you say about fake projective planes just from this description? Um, well, uh, you can compute um, early characteristic of uh, say uh, an H and uh, instead of uh, the usual formula that we're used to it n plus one times n plus two over two now it's with the minus that's what the Riemann row gives you and so um, uh, as a result you're not gonna be able to find some nice um, embeddings of um, of this H so if you do n equals four, then um, chi of uh, S four uh, H is uh, three. So uh, looks like uh, um, a 16 to one cover of uh, P2. So that's not really that good. Uh, maybe n equals five, uh, five H would be uh, six. So maybe, uh, maybe uh, it, you'll have in P5, but uh, a 
degree is uh, 25 here. And um, of interest to us is um, uh, using the twice canonical embedding. So this you can compute um, the dimension uh, is 10. So you can think of S um, as maybe sitting in P9 um, of degree 36. So um, this is sort of the most natural thing to consider the twice canonical embedding, not the only thing, but uh, if life is good, so if nothing weird happens, then uh, S uh, should be cut out uh, by 84 cubic equations. in uh, 10 variables. And by nothing weird happens, I mean, well, who knows if the map, uh, if the system is uh, base point free, who knows if it's uh, an embedding, and then who knows if it's projectively normal. In the cases computed so far is true. And then there are some results without explicit computations where you can say that some of it is true. But um, it's not easy a priori to argue that. All right. So, um, what's the history of fake projective planes? Let, let me go back to uh, the slides. So, uh, in 1971, uh, Mumford first constructed uh, a fake projective plane. Um, the idea is that immediately from Norser's formula and um, right about that time there was Bogomolov Miokayao inequality uh, that tells you that in this case, this has to be a ball quotient, right? So it's a quotient of a complex ball um, so um, this complex ball by some kind of a discrete group acting freely. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, two-adic uniformization, it's sort of a two-adic version of a unit ball. And you take a quotient by some kind of discrete subgroup, and then there are theorems, uh, not very explicit, that the result is actually algebraic, and then you, it's, uh, Therefore, you can, uh, it has to be also, gives you also a surface over complex numbers, but you don't get explicit equations out of it. Um, maybe you could if you could actually uh, really find uh, those uh, two-adic modular forms, but it doesn't seem feasible at the moment. So what happened um, afterwards is uh, people looked at it, not that many people, but over a long time. And there were a few more examples. Uh, I think I'm missing some people, uh, maybe Toledo and co-authors had other examples, but um, they're generally again uh, from this uh, two-adic uniformization. Uh, Kium's example was uh, starting with uh, Mumford. Uh, Mumford's FPP, you construct another FPP in commensurability class, yeah. Uh, so uh, Kulikov and Karlamov proved that they come in complex conjugate pairs. Uh, so in general, you can, you can ask, uh, uh, let's say you have this representation as a quotient uh, of a ball by a group. Uh, what if you conjugate all the matrix elements? Yeah, here's another surface. Could be the same could be not the same until they prove that it's actually non-isomorphic to the original one. So it's diffeomorphic, uh, but not, um, but not um, biholomorphic. 
Um, a big breakthrough, from my opinion, uh, was the work of Klingler, who proves that it's a bulk quotient by an arithmetic group. Uh, what sort of arithmetic groups we're talking about? Uh, well, you have some kind of uh, uh, yeah, so, so so some kind of arithmetic groups, but uh, not matrix quite matrix. Well, they're linear groups, but um, you have to do some kind of division algebras of uh, dimension nine uh, over some extension of uh, rational numbers. It actually is pretty hairy. Uh, and, but uh, Prasad and Yeung were able to bound uh, this, possi this possible commas to a finite list. Something like uh, 20 or 30 different possible uh, classes of groups. Um, because essentially everything else just gives you quotients that have too large um, a k squared, too large a volume. So it's not worth uh, bothering with them. And then uh, character Steger uh, with computers, uh, uh, with heavy magma calculation, just computed all the possible subgroups of finite index that might give you the uh, of this uh, Prasad Yeung classes. And they came up with um, 150 total, 50 pairs of uh, fake projective planes. Um, and by come up, I mean that they have explicit matrix elements that generate, um, generate you uh, the discrete subgroup. So it's good in some ways. Uh, for example, uh, they were able to compute the torsion and the uh, Picard group in all of this example, and there's always torsion. So, uh, you know, they could also compute uh, automorphisms of the fake projective planes, and uh, some of them have no automorphisms, and then some of them have automorphism group of order seven, seven maybe, uh, definitely of order three is very common. Uh, there are a few with uh, Z3 cross Z3, and they'll play a role in what I'm going to talk about next. And then um, there are three pairs which have uh, a non-abelian automorphism group of order 21, a semi-direct product of uh, cyclic group of order seven and cyclic group of order three. Okay, so, Uh, four years ago, jointly with John Hay Q, uh, we gave um, explicit equations of a fake projective plane, well, uh, one of them, as a degree 36 surface in CP9. Well, uh, here they are. Um, you have 10 variables, and there is a group action that uh, permutes them. There is also another group action um, uh, of a group of order seven, uh, for which use are just uh, eigen elements, eigen variables. And so here they are. Uh, this is one equation, and then you have various translates of that equation. There should be 84 of them, and uh, yeah, there are 84 of them. It only takes two pages. And if you think this is ugly, well, that's just because you haven't seen uh, much. Um, this is actually not bad. Of course, it's not human readable, but it's nothing to a computer. And um, in fact, uh, the liberating philosophy of all of it is you don't have to prove much in the beginning. You can do whatever you wanna do. And at the end, you have your equations and then you prove that that's a fake projective plane. Uh, well, how do you prove that? Well, again, you have to use a computer, uh, but um, various uh, Macaulay 2 and Magma, uh, you can verify things like uh, it's a surface, it's a smooth surface. It's uh, then you, you know, it's a, probably takes about uh, an hour, maybe 30 minutes for some simple surface like this. And uh, it's not too bad. But of course, uh, you don't just guess them. So how do, did we find them? So here is the, uh, the setup. Um, maybe I'll go to the other, 
No, I think it's okay. Uh, let's do it this way. So you have a bulk quotient, which is this big fake projective plane. It's not just any fake projective plane. Uh, it's uh, has a very special property, uh, the automorphism uh, group um, is, uh, uh, is of order um, 21. And if you take a quotient by a Z7, then you still have a Z3 acting on this, uh, on this uh, surface. And the good thing about this surface is um, Kadara dimension drops. It's Kadara dimension one, not Kadara dimension two. And so if uh, we resolve the singularity, um, then what you get here is, um, an elliptic vibration, uh, an example of so-called uh, Dolgachev surface. And this elliptic vibration has a double fiber and a vertible fiber, uh, vibration over P1. Um, it also has an I9 fiber. Uh, this is all something that you can see uh, from um, without knowing explicit equations. Uh, you can figure out uh, the fixed points of this uh, Z7 action and uh, not, uh, it's not something automatic, but it has been done. In fact, it's been done by Q. Um, now, um, X is a two to one cover. So you take this two to one cover uh, ramified over uh, these uh, locations over the singular fibers and then you take Cartesian square and normalize. Uh, and then uh, this X is a little bit better. It's, um, well, so, it's better, it has a Z3 action and Z2 action. But what's important on it uh, is that uh, on X, there is some, there is a nice divisor. With uh, D squared equals six and other characteristic equals four. So there's a lot of numerology going on here. You're looking for nice divisors uh, hopefully they'll give you maps into a small enough projective space. And this is really pretty small. Uh, so you uh, also have this uh, Z2 uh, uh, group action. So you can actually prove it, not that you need to, uh, that this divisor uh, is a base point, gives a base point free system. Uh, and you have a map to uh, P3 and the image is, um, degree six non-normal surface. And this degree six non-normal surface has some very specific singularities. I'm not going to bore you with the description of it, uh, but because uh, it's not really applicable to anything but this particular project, but uh, then you uh, put in a, an indeterminate um, degree six Z2 invariant uh, surface in P3, so coefficients, I don't know, 30 or so coefficients. And then uh, you put in conditions on those singularities and a little bit more, and uh, not by hand, of course, but by Mathematica, uh, you're able to compute uh, the equation of X. And here it is, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's human readable, but not human understandable but it really isn't so bad. I mean, it's what, how bad is it? Uh, so one feature is that you see it's uh, defined over square root of negative seven. And if you take a complex conjugate, just replace uh, I by negative I, then you get the complex conjugate uh, fake projective plane situation. Uh, once you get X, it still takes a couple months uh, of thought, 
not a lot of actual computer work, but just uh, we weren't really. It was uh, all uncharted territory for us to go from X back to the fake projective plane. Uh, what you do okay, uh, to get to Y, it's not so bad, it's just invar taking in this U invariance. Now, uh, this right here is the, is the seven-fold Galois cover. And so essentially you have to attach a seventh root of an appropriate rational function to the uh, field of uh, rational functions on Y. And then you have to compute the sections of the bicanonical class on it, and it's all been done. And then you get these uh, pretty nice 80, um, 84 uh, cubics in 10 variables. Uh, any questions? So unfortunately- yeah, if, possible, if possible to ask one question, please. Yes, please. Uh -huh. uh, I would ask you, uh, if possible, to tell us a few words about the motivation, why these fake projective planes are important, interesting, where do they appear naturally, et cetera, et cetera. Just briefly, please. Thank you. Right. So the motivation, I think, my personal motivation is just I like a good challenge, right? Uh, and then this is the case where you know there are surfaces, but you don't know explicit equations. Okay. I think original motivation is people are just generally fascinated with surfaces of general type uh, that uh, don't have um, anything, any Hodge numbers other than the diagonal. Okay. And there's been a lot of work historically on those surfaces. I think they originally, uh, 100 years ago, there was a conjecture that this could only be CP2, but that was uh, before people really knew what they were doing. Uh, so it's just interesting in its own right to try to construct surfaces with small Hodge numbers, um, okay. as sort of an algebraic geometer as a zookeeper, uh, just uh, figuring out uh, some weird animals in the zoo. Uh, but uh, they've been also used in constructing um, phantom categories, uh, not uh, yeah, like um, quasi-phantom categories, because uh, the key uh, the key group. Uh, you know, the, the PCAR is three, so you just have to find the exceptional collection of links three, and then you get something interesting uh, as the some in the from the some orthogonal the, the composition. Mm -hmm. So they've been used for that. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank uh, you very uh, much. Thank you. Anything uh, more substantial? Uh, I doubt it. Right. I mean, it's just okay. uh, curiosity. Understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, uh, let's see. So that's one project. Um, and then, uh, you know, of course, once you start getting into it, you don't just stop on one project. So the next project um, was the cartwright Stega surface. It's a unique surface of general type with these Hodge numbers. So how did it come up? Um, so this surface still has a uh, chi of O equals one, and it still has um, C2 equals three. So you have, uh, uh, of course, K squared is uh, nine. Uh, so when Cartwright and Steger were uh, looking to classify all the fake projective planes, uh, they were classifying those uh, discrete groups acting on the ball. And uh, this one looked like it could be a fake projective plane, but because it had um, infinite um, abelianization of the group, uh, of the fundamental group, it led to one here and not zero. Still, it was an interesting surface. Um, the group was a little bit different in this case. It was um, some kind of, it was a little bit easier group um, uh, uh, in, uh, you didn't have to go to this, uh, uh, what should I call it? To, 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 yeah, yeah. to this division algebra, it was just uh, some matrix group. And uh, in a joint work with Saiki Yun, we constructed 
uh, equations of this guy in this bicanonical embedding. So uh, again, 10 variables. So it looks the same numerically, so you expect 10 variables, but uh, something is happening and it's probably related to that H1. Um, I cannot, I don't know why, but I'm sure that there is a reason. So somehow it's not a projectively uh, normal embedding. It's an embedding, uh, but just not projectively normal. Uh, so, in specifically, there is a quadratic equation where there shouldn't be. Uh, so there is a quadratic equation, and then there are seventy-four cubic equations, and uh, you must be crazy to write them all. So here's one of them. Okay, what's interesting is that this is actually defined over integers, or I mean over rational numbers. Uh, there isn't any natural integer structure that I could think of, but okay, uh, you can pick one. Uh, it's actually contradicted some result in the literature. There was a gap and uh, mistake in the paper that claimed that this was also shouldn't be isomorphic to it, uh, complex conjugate, but uh, this one was isomorphic to complex conjugate. So in fact, there is just one. Okay, how do you find it? Uh, well, again, uh, uh, you start um, uh, with uh, a description of the bulk quotient. Um, there is a larger, there is a larger surface uh, corresponding to a smaller group. Um, so this is, a, uh, there are three to one maps here vertically. Um, no, I'm sorry, not three to one. This is a 21 to one. Uh, Galois covers all. <clears throat> This is three to one. Um, this one is singular. And uh, this is resolution of singularities. So all of it you see from the bold description. This surface Z3 is the one you can get, your, uh, get a handle on. What's nice about it, it's uh, automorphism group. Um, is approximately uh, 6,000. Uh, I, I don't remember the number, maybe 6048 or something. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, PGU33. Uh, three, three. So actually finite simple group. And uh, then you could um, identify Z3 simply using uh, the group invariance. When your group is this large, you're just able to say, okay, uh, uh, Z3 is embedded into um, P12 because uh, it, this PGU33 has, uh, this is a canonical embedding. Um, and this PGU33 has a unique, uh, dimension 13 uh, irreducible representation. And then you just uh, check what the quadrix that define it could be. And uh, the reps are so rigid that there really uh, no room at all. You just immediately see C3. You have to verify with the computer that that's in fact the surface, but it's not hard. Uh, then uh, to go from C3 back to CS, it's, uh, not so, not so easy. Uh, the tricky step is this three to one cover. Uh, uh, but uh, somehow with again, using the large symmetry group, we were able to do it. And then uh, you get the CS, the cartwright stegas surface. Okay. Now, that was all nice, uh, but the work I'm most proud of is this uh, joint work with uh, uh, Enrico Fatigenti. And uh, we construct six more pairs of these fake projective planes. So this one, I'm going to uh, uh, switch to uh, notes. So we'll go a little slower and I will just, Just uh, write some notes. Okay. 
So how did this whole thing start? Uh, it was actually a conference uh, at Edinburgh uh, where I gave a talk about um, uh, those two uh, papers and Enrico was in the audience. And uh, he noticed uh, that uh, the Hodge diamond uh, uh, Lev, I think yes. there's a question. Uh, at yes. least Francesca raising his hand. Oh yeah, yeah. I can I can hear anything. So can you can you say it? Yeah. Francesca, yes. are you do you want to ask yes. a question? Okay, please. Yes, go. yes, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask first, uh, why do you say that uh Kartweiler Steger surface is the unique one with this invariance? I mean you are assuming I that the fundamental true. group. I mean the fundamental group is arithmetic, you know this, or you are just assuming this? Well, I think, I think, well, oh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I, I have to admit, I could be wrong. I thought that that was followed from their classification, but I'm not, uh, but I could be, I could be wrong. For all I, I know, you may be right that Klingler maybe only applies to the yeah. actual fake projective. G equal to equal zero, I think. In this case, I uh, see. okay, okay, I see, I see. Well, yeah, and well, I, then uh, I put a question mark here. Thank you. Thank you. So, and just a very quick question Could you <laughs> check the singularity of the Albanese pencil in this case? Yeah, it has all been, yeah, it has all been computed. Uh, and I think uh, Carlos Rito has. Uh, um, so yeah, so I computed some. I mean, uh, I was I was a little sloppy in re in uh, recording it. I shared some of it with Carlos, and he computed stuff. So uh, it's a mess, but you can all compute. But it's all computable. Uh, it's not. Uh, I mean, with the explicit equations, you can compute the Albanese. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, uh, let's go back to here. The automorphism group uh, is uh, is this. And uh, so, so Z sits inside um, um, uh, sits inside uh, P12 and um, uh, degree is uh, 42. And so uh, Enrico got excited uh, because uh, he has seen these numbers. So um, these are, um, so this looks like Um, a complete intersection of uh, um, seven Pluca hyperplanes uh, uh, in uh, G36. Okay. So you take a Grassmannian G36 and you find the seven Pluca hyperplanes and uh, you get this gadget. And um, what Enrico was interested in uh, is uh, trying to uh, find, um, um, uh, so he wanted to um, find um, a group uh, of uh, order 14 uh, acting freely on these uh, complete intersections. Uh, to get um, as this this type of surface. So when you take a quotient, then it would be this surface, uh, which are, you know, um, again, uh, uh, very interesting families. Uh, you can study them, uh, try to classify them. So he wanted this. Uh, unfortunately for him, he only found uh, a, a Z7, a cyclic group of order seven acting. But we were able to, um, so, but, but, you know, like this particular uh, Z actually has a free group of order uh, 14 acting on it. And then we were able to actually understand it um, 
it's like a it's a classical construction. So the classical um, algebraic geometers should have seen it. Uh, you can completely verify it by hand, but it's almost verifiable by hand. So uh, let me uh, show you a construction of. Uh, this is actually a cyclic group of order 14. Uh, so I have to say that uh, in this field, people like to write C14 for cyclic groups. And I also like to say Z14. So I'm just going to have to switch between one and the other and pretend it's the same thing. Uh, so a free um, C14 action on um, a complete intersection of uh, seven. Uh, uh, Plucar uh, hyperplanes in G36. Okay, so uh, you start with a vector space V, uh, and you'll have a cyclic group of order seven acting, and the uh, weights are um, one, two, three, uh, four, five, six, in the sense that. Um, the action is by the seventh root of unity to the one, two, three, four, five, sixth power. Uh, there are actually some reasons why it has to be this and not something else, but um, anyway. And then uh, you take um, G3, uh, G3V. And of course, uh, you have this uh, C7 acting. Uh, but you can also construct a uh, commuting C2 on it as follows. Uh, uh, pick a skew form, uh, x1 wedge x6 uh, plus x2 wedge x5 plus x4 wedge x3, where uh, x is a coordinates on V. And then, um, uh, so that's a skew form. And then there is a map from uh, Grassmannian to itself. Uh, which sends, um, uh, let's say, W to W perp uh, with respect to uh, the skew form. So that W goes to a twist annihilator. And because the form is C7 invariant, this actually gives a commuting action um, of uh, in the automorphism of the Grassmannian. Yeah, this is something that, uh, you know, you live and you learn. I mean, for some reason, I always thought that the automorphisms of Grassmannians were just the PGL. But um, when it's a uh, Grassmannian K2K, there is also a little bit extra. Uh, there is another connected component. And in particular, you have this uh, involution in there. Uh, but anyway, so, so it's the group is, uh, the uh, component of the identity is the PGL uh, 6. but uh, there is more to the automorphism than just a component of the identity. Okay, now uh, once you have it, uh, you can look at um, um, action of uh, this C14 on uh, wedge three of uh, the dual, and uh, it splits according to eigen uh, eigenspaces. And then uh, you take a complete intersection, again, uh, um, careful uh, picking uh, elements from the eigenspaces. Uh, spaces, uh, splits, into, splits into eigenspaces. And um, once you do that, that uh, you're able to uh, write equations. So these are Plucker equations of a complete intersection in G36 with this free C14 action. As you see, completely doable by hand. And in fact, I think we may have done some of it by hand. Uh, what's not so easy is to, is to show that it actually is a complete intersection. I mean, by computer, it's nothing. But by hand, it's a little bit. Uh, I, I, don't, I tried just out of uh, spite and <laughs> wasn't able to do that. Uh, now. So this was already very interesting for us. Uh, if you, so what these are, uh, so X is a Pluca variables, Pluca coordinates, 
in the standard Plucker embedding. Uh, so uh, these are the parameters. And if you count them, uh, there are seven parameters. And, uh, but there's also a little bit of uh, torus symmetry. There is a, a three-dimensional symmetry. So really this is actually a four-dimensional family. I believe uh, we computed that is actually a full family. Uh, so there are no further deformations. Uh, right. Now, uh, there is more in here, but um, to explain that, I want to uh, go back to the the nodes. So, okay, once you uh, ask, uh, is this a new family? Well, uh, there was a, a big survey, uh, trying to remember who are the authors. Um, oh, escapes my mind. But there's a survey, a standard survey on the surfaces of general type. Um, and uh, there, uh, this surface, it was listed. So it wasn't new. Uh, but the way it was not new is the following. There was some fake projective plane with a, a C3 uh, cross, uh, uh, nah, Six with a fake projective plane with a, uh, a C3 cross C3 group action. And if you took a, a quotient by one of this, Uh, mod C3, uh, then, um, and then do some smoothing, uh, non explicitly, mind you, you don't have explicit equation, then the smoothing will be um, surfaces uh, with k squared equals um, three. Yeah, so here is k squared is nine, here is k squared is three. And it had uh, three A2 singularities. And then you do uh, smoothing, and then you have this family uh, with um, K squared equals three and fundamental group uh, C14. Um, it follows from the uh, group structure that you had a fundamental group C14. So now it was uh, natural for us to assume that we got the same family, and now we decided to go back and try to construct the fake projective plane. All right, uh, so what do you do? Uh, this family, uh, this fake projective plane should be some kind of special element in the family. It has a, an additional C3 symmetry, which uh, made some guesses. Uh, so you guess that the C3 symmetry corresponds to uh, this cyclic permutation of the variables, uh, uh, you know, in Z7 star one to two to four and back to one. And you make this assumption and then you look at the surfaces with additional C3 symmetry. And then um, obviously computer work, uh, trying to find under, for which parameters you get uh, 42 A2 singularities. Uh, so 42 is because there is a C3 symmetry, but there is also a C14 symmetry. Uh, so the way to do it was to first uh, compute the curve of where the complete intersections are singular, and then look, look at the singularities of the singular curve, and then uh, plug things in and hope for the best. And uh, that was, this is actually not bad. Uh, so uh, this is a description of a 14-fold cover of a C3 quotient uh, of a fake projective plane. Fine. Uh, so from here, you get to the quotient of the fake projective plane by C3, but finding the triple cover 
was a bear. Uh, so that took about half a year uh, because you just, uh, so uh, essentially you have a surface with A2 singularities and you have to find the wild divisor which is not a Cartier device. You know, how do you find it? Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, we were able to see that it could all boil down to solving some 67 equations in 16 variables and the variables and the equations were uh, 55 cubics and the 12 quadratic equations. The coefficients were algebraic integers. Uh, uh, the uh, field here was uh, Q of uh, 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 root of negative 15. The problem is uh, as soon as you seize uh, your equations from three digits go to 10 digits and then go to 100 digits. So it's very hard to uh, keep the coefficients down without having a good idea what uh, the correct basis for the variable is. And you really don't have a correct basis. So our equations had coefficients of about 100 digits long. If you try to put it into uh, various software, it didn't do anything, uh, but there was a nice trick. Uh, we uh, went to finite characteristic. And in finite characteristic, uh, magma uh, in finite time, like in 15 minutes, computed the Hilbert polynomial and found that there was one solution. Now that's, then you know you're in business because um, uh, it, the field was small, so you just do linear cuts and you just find that solution by doing linear cuts and making sure you still have a non-zero Hilbert polynomial. And uh, once you have it mod 19, which it was, uh, you just go 19 squared, 19 cube, and uh, uh, then you, uh, you're able to approximate your solutions in uh, 19 adic numbers. And from there you can find them um, as uh, algebraic integers. Yeah, by the way, um, you know, some of the sort of computer innovations, I'm not sure how much of innovation is, but we you know, just had to use what we could use. And one trick was, uh, let's say you have a complicated system of equations and uh, you want to find the ring of invariance of the quotient. So you, you want to find a quotient by some uh, finite group. Um, Trying to do it uh, with exact coefficients uh, often seemed to take forever. But the trick was to compute uh, a cloud of points on your surface uh, with a very high degree accuracy, maybe 500 digit accuracy, maybe more, uh, and then uh, evaluate the invariance on those points and then find linear equations on uh, or quadratic equations or whatever equations on those invariants. And then uh, Mathematica has a way of seeing that if, if a number looks like it's square root of negative seven, then it's square root of negative seven. If you have a give me a long enough number, uh, you can, uh, it has a root approximate command. What it does is just uh, finds a small rational approximate uh, um, combina linear combinations uh, on powers of your number and it tells you what the number should be. So it's not rigorous, but we don't have to be rigorous. Remember once at the end, we can verify things. Uh, maybe it can be made rigorous uh, by checking uh, with exact coefficients, but it's not really worth it. So once we found um, this, uh, so this was this um, uh, quotient uh, by C3. Uh, this was the fake projective plane um, with uh, C3 cross C3 uh, acting on it. And um, uh, this had uh, torsion in the Picard was uh, C14. So that's where the C14 comes from. Um, then um, it had relatives. It had uh, five more pairs of uh, fake projective planes, uh, which are in the same commensurability class. Uh, so this is all from Cartwright and Steger. 
the fat lines are Galois covers, and the non-fat lines are uh, triple covers, which are not Galois covers, right? Um, so when you have a triple cover, uh, cubic extension, uh, if it's not Galois, then uh, you know it's uh, it says actually Galois Galois group is S three, and then you just take uh, and it's, it comes from there. So uh, there was a trick. Uh, I call it a FPP crawler, and basically allows you to go from one to the adjacent one under certain assumptions. You want it to have a double cover to be able to do it. And uh, we did it, and we got five more. There are some caveats. So these two uh, creatures right here, so um, they're defined over. Uh, Z square root of negative 15 and uh, uh, square root of uh, negative three. So there are four of them, uh, two complex conjugate pairs. And the method completely doesn't allow me to say which one is which. I just have no idea. Uh, this, they're not, uh, by holomorphic, I don't think they're um, even diffeomorphic. Um, uh, but uh, I mean, I dream about just starting from equations and uh, finding the fundamental group and matching it with cartwright Steger, but that wasn't possible. And then there were also a couple other annoying things. I forgot it for which of them, uh, but we weren't able to reduce the field um, uh, the field to z of negative root of 15, um, we, we still had the uh, root of negative three in there, even though we know uh, that you don't get uh, different ones when you pass to a, comp to a country. Okay, very good. So we have, uh, what, about uh, seven, eight minutes. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's a crown jewel, but it's sort of the extra level of monstrosity which is the last project. And this was uh, with um, uh, Enrico and my colleague Anders Buch. So in that, uh, in that paper, uh, it was mentioned that uh, there's an analog FPP where C14 gets replaced by C13. Uh, gets replaced in the sense that there is an FPP uh, with a, a C13, uh, no, with a C3 cross C3 action. And then you take a quotient by one of the C3, and then uh, you take smoothing, and then you have this uh, surface uh, S um, with uh, uh, this uh, hash diamond. And um, its fundamental group is uh, 13, C13. 13. Well, uh, you, you may be looking at degree 39 equations in P11, and you know the, um, you know the Hilbert polynomial, and then you start looking to see if it's a complete intersection in anything, and it's not. It doesn't look like a complete intersection in any homogeneous um, variety. But there is something very close. And uh, it's kind of miraculous that it actually works out. Um, so there is this octonionic projective plane. Uh, if you take the Lie, Lie group E6 in its uh, 27 dimensional linear representation, uh, this has a unique uh, cubic invariant called Cartan cubic. And then uh, the singular locus of the Cartan cubic is a 16 dimensional um, complex uh, homogeneous manifold. It's one of the homogeneous spaces for uh, E6. And uh, it's OP2, octonionic projective plane, for you know, uh, many good reasons. And uh, what you do is you do almost a complete intersection. There is one more equation than you would expect, and the degree drops, uh, drops to. Um, uh, to 39 from 78, and you're guided by a choice of uh, an order 13 element in the Cartan 
uh, subgroup of the E6. And uh, you know, it's, it's funny, right? I mean, you have uh, 13, you have Actonians, you have all the cult favorites in one place. You have also fake projection points. And uh, then you do more or less what we did with Enrico. Um, there are complications. Um, the field of definition here eventually is um, a square root of uh, negative two. So it's uh, again, nothing, nothing horrible. But actually the field of definition, uh, they know from the, they know the field of definition from uh, some Shimura variety story. So that, uh, or give or take, I mean, uh, so that's not surprising. Um, and then, uh, Okay, uh, we computed it, uh, but it gets, it just gets complicated. So some uh, 60,000 digits of accuracy had to be used. Uh, and uh, at the end, uh, the equations probably have 100, couple hundred digits long. Uh, this is not so bad. The intermediate steps were, could be a thousand digits long. Um, yeah, I mean, there are all sorts of questions about this whole story. Uh, what do you, uh, you know, how do you make equations nice? I, I don't know if there's any algorithm, really don't. Yeah. So anyway, so what am I doing now with all of it? Well, I am uh, I'm fighting with the Mumford case. I'm trying to get the equation of a Mumford fake projective plate because that's the one that started the whole thing. And uh, it's tough going. Uh, I am able to construct a nine dimensional family of the Dolgachev surfaces. So it's a little bit like the QOMS example, but instead of two four fibers, it's two three fibers, which is worse. So I'm able to construct uh, a nine dimensional family of it uh, by solving some kind of a, a simple system, but in 90 variables and uh, 1800 equations. <laughs> but uh, it gets, I get stuck after that. I need to uh, find a specific one with specific properties and uh, it's hard going. Anyway, I think uh, uh, that's all. So I'll stop here and uh, try to field any questions you may have. Thank you, Liv. That thanks, Liv. Just, uh, okay, good. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. Uh, please, uh, questions, ask questions. Yes, Francesca, please go ahead. Yeah, I would like to ask if, in principle, you think if it is possible to implement this kind of, uh, I mean, uh, arguments for all the fake projective planes in the in the list, I mean, for all the 50 pairs of fake projective planes. Uh, yeah, right. So the ones we get so far, they have some special features. Typically they have a large automorphism group or maybe they're related to the ones with a largish automorphism group, right? If you don't have anything to grab onto, uh, it gets very difficult. So I don't know that this sort of arguments can be expected to get all of the fake projective planes, but you should be able to get some more. Uh, ideally one should try to ask, can you just uh, compute uh, the modular forms for those groups? The trouble is there is no, there are no cusps. So you're not gonna be able to write some fast conversion series. So, I'm, so I'm, I don't know. So I'm hoping that there may be some kind of uh, um, analytic methods uh, with uh, again, some computer uh, help uh, to be able to construct it. Because you can argue that you have the description as a quotient of the ball. So you, so you could write your complex compact manifold with coordinate charts, if you wish. And, but then how do you solve uh, the del bar equals zero? How do you find sections of a line bundle explicit? Well, it's as some, it, with some reasonable accuracy, I don't know. If, uh, if someone was able to have a really fast solver of this specific P, uh, you know, PDE, then that uh, might do the job. But uh, so that may be the future actually. The future may be non-algebraic geometry, but rather uh, sort of uh, 
uh, numerical PGs, but uh, I, I talk to people and I, I don't think they, they know how to attack this particular. So I, I don't know, like, that's my take on it. Maybe there is some nicer, uh, maybe there is something else that one could do. Maybe you could embed this in some interesting uh, dimension three Shimura varieties, right? So I was hoping maybe you take a uh, Hilbert modular varieties of um, dimension three. These have isolated um, singular points. So you may hope that if you have some interesting uh, 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 hypersurfaces in them, maybe you can get fake projective planes or some relative of fake projective planes. But I don't know. I was not, uh, I didn't uh, try to, I mean, I tried a little bit and I got nowhere, but that doesn't mean that it's hopeless. Thank you. Thank you, Lev. I, I have strange question. Uh, yes. So for, for, for example, just uh, suppose you ask the same question like about Enriquez surface. How uh -huh. you can, uh, wait, wait, no, 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 no. This is not a question. It's just, uh, let, let me finish. So you can consider this as a quotient of K3, or you can take, for example, classical uh, model of uh, Enriquez, like a non-normal sextic in P3. Yeah? Which sure. Passes. So what if uh, for some of this, fake projective planes, you have some nice, easy to describe model, but not normal in uh, P3. So, so after all, everything is hypersurface. <laughs> well, everything... No, right, right. Everything is hypersurface. Yeah, but right. maybe then, some uh, nice one. Maybe some something that easy to see, easy to describe, some, something, no? Yeah, that would be great. Uh, the degree would have to be large, right? It kind of it, it's kind yeah. of the same story. How do you how do you write coefficients that are so small? For for your examples, for example, if you exclude everything and you end mm -hmm. up uh, like t take bunch of resultants and take a, a hypersurface, it's, it's it's ugly, yeah. So the hypersurface you could stick. I think you could get degree twenty five in P three. You could get a non. I mean, I think all of these fake projective planes you should be able to get. Uh, as degree 25 uh, hypersurfaces in P3, normalizations of. Okay, okay. But I don't think, don't know of any natural way. And so I expect the answers will be ugly. But maybe weighted projective. So, so actually, yeah, uh, all, all weighted, all weighted projective. Right. I mean, yeah. uh, so uh, some of these uh, intermediate surfaces, they're not so horrible uh, because uh, you could see them. Uh, yeah, so maybe actually, like even, uh, yeah, actually, I do have this, these equations, right? So this is an equation of this um, uh, 13 fold, uh, 13 fold. So these are those, these are almost complete intersections in, uh, in the octonionic uh, projective plane. So you see, this is not horrible. Mm -hmm. And then D1 and D2 are some parameters and their explicit value for those. Uh, so they're not, it's just the end result. The fake projective plane, um, it just doesn't have a lot of curves on it, right? It doesn't have any rational curves. It doesn't have any elliptic curves on it right? because it's a quotient of the ball. Um, you know, so you, you're not gonna, you, you just uh, hyperbolicity tells you that you don't have any of that. And uh, that kind of limits of what you might expect. Okay, 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 I got yeah. it. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions uh, to Lev? Uh, so if no, let's thank Lev again. Lev, thank you very much. All right, great. Thank you. Thanks, great. And uh, I wish you luck in your search. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will need it. Yes, I will definitely need it. Maybe you Thank should uh, organize some uh, collaborative project, you know, like online projects where people contribute something like that. with many people. Maybe well, yeah, so that's actually the trouble with this whole area, right? Uh, how do you train people in it? Because the difficulty is not in the computers, the difficulty is in algebraic geometry, right? So mm -hmm. I, I wish I could train like young people to really get into it, but you almost need to, uh, you know, it, it's hard, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I could formulate some problems uh, where you just, but, but without real knowledge of algebraic geometry, you're not going to be able to really work in this field, right? Uh, so, no, I mean, I, I think this is, I mean, no, me writing people with, with like five different uh, co-authors is my way of uh, four different, four, four different co-authors is my way of expanding the field. 
and I'm sure I'll work with other people as well. Uh, but uh, you know, it's just it's hard to get the younger people in this field, right? Maybe so my students, to, I don't. Maybe train we need them to establish it. some prize. <laughs> Exactly. Some grant to establish some prize. Right. Young exactly. people like prizes. So, yeah. so, so my students, I'm still going to train them in mirror symmetry for, for the time being, right? So mm -hmm. this is sort of a hobby of mine. Even though the hobby has become, it's becoming more of a main, main thing, but uh, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much. It was very nice right, to sure. see you. Okay. And uh, hope to see you in the future in real life. All right. Yeah. See you. I mean, yeah. Good. See you. And I'm very glad that uh, our conference in Edinburgh helped. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, no, Thank no, no. It, it, absolutely, it was absolutely crucial. Right. No, no question about it. Okay. See ya. See you, bye.